questions. Good afternoon, friends. I request all of you to kindly take your seats. I am L. V. Subramaniam, the former Chief Secretary to Government of Andhra Pradesh. I have great pleasure in inviting you to this interactive session with Sri Rajiv Malhotra Ji as well as Professor Vijaya Vishwanathan. We have been waiting for this program for last couple of months. Ever since we have become fans of Rajiv Malhotra Ji after his written his path-breaking book, Breaking India. I first invite our important people who are going to address us here. Uh, can I please start with uh, Shri K. Arvind Ravagaru, the former DGP of police in the United Andhra Pradesh Kada, who is himself uh, a writer. He has translated a lot of books. Shri Shirish Dopeshwarji, he is the president of the Telangana Pragya Bharati branch, who has been guiding us in organizing this. Sri Sarangapani ji is the person who is transliterating the work into Telugu, the spoken and the written language in this part of the country. Professor Vijaya Vishwanathan ji, who has been the co-author, I request her also to kindly come and occupy her chair. And Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji, kindly please come. In this brief visit to the city of Hyderabad, Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji will be addressing different groups in different venues which have all been shared with you. Across the country, we have got people who have admired his writings and who have always appreciated his way of thinking where he brought fresh insights into the kind of developments which are outside the country but which impinge on the nature of how this polity functions. He has opened our eyes to some of these happenings outside the country so that the people within the country, all of us, we may have our own differences, we may have our own side of arguments, but as a nation, we are together, we want to remain together, we want to make it into a strong nation. But sometimes, unwittingly, the dialogue which develops overseas, it begins to dominate our narrative in this country, and which can always draw some schisms within the country. So this knowledge which Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji has been bringing has always enabled thinkers, writers, columnists, political thinkers to understand the ramifications of some of this ideology which is coming from overseas and see what is its relevance, context, and how do we tackle this nuisance to see that the country's unity is not broken? So it is that perspective which he has been building in all of us. And Pragya Bharati, as you know, is an organization which has always lent its platform for such discussion to bring unity in our thinking, to understand the essence of diversity and to take a path which is acceptable to all. Pragya Bharati, in association with Brihat, is organizing this program of Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji. Several, several people have come forward to support us. The list can be quite long. We will be paying our gratitude to all of them at the appropriate occasion. I welcome all the members of the press to the conference today. And may I now request Shri K. Arvind Rao Garu to give us the context of the visit briefly before we start the discussion with Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji. Thank you, Subramanian ji. 
I am very glad and I feel privileged to welcome Sri Rajiv Malhotra and uh, Professor Vijaya Vij Vijayaji here uh, to this uh, Hyderabad city. Rajiv Malhotra ji has been visiting India for the last several years. And uh, first of all, I, I will tell you my acquaintance with him. About uh, 12 years ago, I read his book, first, uh, not first book, already he had written some books. I read his book called Breaking India. About 11 years ago, I read it. And uh, when I first read it, having worked for uh, about more than for 34 years in the police department, and that too in fairly senior level, I felt ashamed that I did not know so many things which were written in that book. Because he told about several aspects. He described several, ang several ways in which the country was being attacked. So we, we are not aware of it. We are aware of some limited sphere here. In fact, he had done, I felt, I personally felt that he had done a phenomenal work what the intelligence agencies, the central intelligence agencies have to do, or what probably the foreign officers have to do. So much of intelligence collection was there, and he had written certain irrefutable things in that. He had, um, some, he had made some strong comments on certain people who were Indian citizens only, but then who were helping outsiders, and then who were helping the breaking India forces. So he had written something about them, and so far, no one has challenged. And he had written that he had done adequate research about those things. It is not as though he, he is a sort of, uh, he made some wild allegations and all that. He, he did a lot of research and then he produced those, the, all those details which were never challenged. So that was my first experience with Rajiv ji. And thereafter, I had an occasion to personally meet him in the Swadeshi Indology Conference in Delhi. So that is my acquaintance with him. Then, come, talk, if I have to introduce Sri Rajiv ji, so he has been an, he has been in America for the last 50 years or so, an entrepreneur, an IT person, basically an IT person, artificial intelligence. Uh, he, uh, so his basic subject is that, and uh, he also ran some companies, made some good money, but not for himself. But he was also a good donor to several universities, and in that process. He came to know, he was acquainted, he got acquainted with some of the professors in the universities. And we all think that professors in the universities are very, very noble people. But then there are also people who have various plans. The professors in America and other Western universities, they have got their own agenda. They have an agenda to analyze a country, analyze what are all the fault lines in a country, and then see how they, the countries can be broken and how they can... Uh, uh, um, exploit the resources of that particular country for the benefit of their uh, any Western country, let us say. Not only America, but any Western country. So usually that is the approach of very many professors there. So he, incidentally, probably, he got in touch with all those people. And then he discovered that there was some, there was, uh, some massive uh, plan, or rather not only one, Several, several massive, um, uh, several uh, networks which were operating against the interests of India. So it was at that time that he further did some research into that, and then he brought out his books like Invading the Sac Invading the Sacred and Breaking India. Then again, thereafter, he wrote another uh, very well, very well received book called uh, Battle for Sanskrit. The Battle for Sanskrit. The Battle for Sanskrit is again something to do with our culture. Basically, if you want to denigrate a nation, if you want to destroy a culture, one way to destroy the culture is, destroy the culture is to give a, dog, give a dog a bad name and hang him. So that is the policy. So that way, you denigrate the culture by misinterpreting the text and then giving all types of uh, wrong interpretations. So all those things he studied. And uh, then again, later, some, one of his recent, recent books is Artificial Intelligence, How It Is Going to Change Our uh, Lives. And then again, and that again, artificial intelligence also in the context of the national security only. And that another book, Breaking India, again, he is from in the context of uh, national security. And again, his recent book, Snakes in the Ganga. Of course, it has nothing to do with the snakes or with the Ganges, <laughs> Ganga. It has something to do with the people uh, who are sitting in Western universities. Very high, very high universities, so-called highly respected uh, universities called Ivy League universities. 
and then who are having so many agents who are having their own agenda to break various countries. So how those people are nurturing a particular uh, atmosphere, nurturing some people. So we know these are all the old techniques only. We all know that uh, our own Niti Shastra, whether it is Kautilya Niti Shastra <coughs> or Kamandaka Niti Shastra, we, have, we are acquainted with the things called Sama, Dana, Bheda, Danda. So this Bheda, how to create divisions within a group, within a, in a targeted group. So that is what exactly they are practicing. There is nothing new, but then we were totally unaware of it. In fact, it is our job to know. It is our job to know, as I said, it is the job of all our intelligence agencies to know it. It is the job of our foreign officers to know that. But unfortunately, we probably uh, skipped that. So it, it uh, went upon Rajivji to, the burden fell on probably him uh, to study them and then to sensitize us. I really feel that uh, he is a person who has opened the eyes of so many scholars in India, particularly Indologists. What is the role of Indian scholars? What should we do? And uh, as um, Subramanian Ji said, we are all having one common interest. That is preservation, preser preserving this nation, preserving the identity or integrity of the nation. So that is, uh, from that point of view, his books are very, very relevant to us. So that is the general, the brief background. So this, I mean, to the, tomorrow and day after, there are different sessions. Tomorrow in the forenoon, there is a session in the Hyderabad Central University. Probably the organizers, our Pragya Bharati people have already um, given, circulated the information to you. Tomorrow the information, the meeting is on the challenges, various forces at play, uh, ch for, uh, challenges for a rising India. So that is the subject matter tomorrow in the forenoon. And again in the afternoon, in the in Institute of Public Enterprise, the subject is almost same. And then uh, there, there will be a discussion with uh, Rajiv Malhotraji and uh, Vijaya Vishwanathanji. And again on 15th, uh, it is organized by one uh, organization called ABRSM, that is uh, Akhila Bharata Rashtriya um, Manch, Vidya, Vidya Manch. So, uh, Shaitshana Manch. So, they are organizing one uh, meeting at the <coughs> SES, or, that is in ICRT. Yeah, that is in ICRT building. Then again in the evening there is a program, 15th evening there is a program called Pragnya Puraskar. This Pragnya Bharati along with Brahat, another organization named Brahat is organizing this whole uh, event. And uh, this Pragnya Puraskar is a, 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 a Puraskar or award given to eminent people every year by Pragnya Bharati. So that award uh, presentation will be there for Rajivji on that evening, 15th evening. Uh, say for all these things, invitations, uh, I mean, um, um, the, 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 who, the attendees, they have to register and then they have to, uh, on the website they have to register and then they can attend. Attendance is absolutely free and uh, all are welcome. I request all the members of the media to uh, say, cover this uh, in, a, uh, in a perfect way, in a proper manner. And uh, basically it is something which has to do with our national security and national interest. So there should not be any sort of misunderstanding about it. Um, in fact, he also writes about the divisive elements within the country. So that also will be there. So even those people can question, because all types, when we have a meeting, all types of people will be there, questions will be there, and Rajivji will be ready to uh, speak to them, discuss with them, explain to them as to what are all these forces, etc. So with this, I leave it, uh, I leave the stage to Rajiv Malhotraji and uh, Vijaya Vishwanathanji. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you are a part of the story, you will be able to talk to Raji Malavutra, and you will be able to talk to him about the story of the story. But this is the story of the story of the story of the story of the Telugu lo dani andri karistunaru, andu guwa ni rendu shal matadu ustenga kordhnan. It's for the local media. One minute, Rajuji. Sarangu pani will just a few words. More for the Telugu media. After that, what? And after that, what you want is an interview, media interview. Over here, here. Andar ki namaskaram. Rajiv Malhotra gariki. Vijay Vishwanathan Gariki, 
స్వాగతం స్నేక్స్ ఇన్ ది గంగా పుస్తకం చూసినప్పుడు చదివినప్పుడు అందులో చాలా చాలా లోతైనటువంటి విషయాలు ఉన్నాయి అసలు అన్ని విషయాల మీద అంత విస్తృతంగా వారు ఎలా పరిశోధన చేశారు దాన్ని ఏ విధంగా పాఠకులకు ముందు తీసుకొచ్చారనే చూస్తే చాలా ఆశ్చర్యం కలుగుతుంది అది చాలా భయం కూడా వేస్తుంది అందులో ఉన్న విషయాలన్నీ చూస్తే హార్వర్డ్ యూనివర్సిటీ కేంద్రంగా భారతదేశానికి వ్యతిరేకంగా జరుగుతున్నటువంటి కుట్ర గురించి అందులో చాలా విపులంగా చర్చించారు అక్కడ పుట్టినటువంటి క్రిటికల్ రేస్ థేరీ ఆధారంగా క్రిటికల్ క్యాష్ థేరీని తీసుకొచ్చి దాన్ని భారతదేశానికి ఎగుమతి చేసి భారతదేశంలో ఉన్నటువంటి బలహీనతలను ఫాల్ట్ లైన్స్ను దెబ్బ కొట్టడానికి చేస్తున్న ప్రయత్నాల గురించి వారు ఆ పుస్తకంలో రాశారు అట్లాగే చైనా సౌదీ అరేబియా అమెరికా ఈ మూడు కూడా ఏ విధంగా ఒక రకమైనటువంటి కల్చరల్ సబ్జుకేషన్ కోసం మనల్ని ప్రయత్నం చేస్తున్నాయి అనే విషయం కూడా వారు చెప్పారు అలాగే రకరకాల నెట్వర్క్స్ ఉన్నాయి ఒమిజియార్ నెట్వర్క్ అని అలాగే మీడియాని ఏ విధంగా కంట్రోల్ చేస్తున్నారు ఇండియాలో ఉన్నటువంటి మీడియాని ఏ విధంగా కంట్రోల్ చేస్తున్నారు ఏ ఏ ఆర్గనైజేషన్స్ ఏ ఏ వ్యక్తులు చాలా ఇంపార్టెంట్ రోల్ ప్లే చేస్తున్నారు వీటి గురించి కూడా వారు ఆ పుస్తకంలో చాలా విపులంగా చర్చించారు అలాగే బ్రేకింగ్ ఇండియా వన్కి బ్రేకింగ్ ఇండియా టూకి మధ్యలో ఉన్నటువంటి ఇంపార్టెంట్ డిఫరెన్సెస్ క్వాలిటేటివ్ డిఫరెన్సెస్ను వారు తీసుకొచ్చారు అప్పటి బ్రేకింగ్ ఇండియా శక్తుల కంటే ఇప్పటి బ్రేకింగ్ ఇండియా శక్తులు చాలా బలమైనవి మేధోపరమైనవి చాలా వ్యూహాత్మకంగా వ్యవహరిస్తున్నాయి సో వీటిని ఎదుర్కోవటం గుర్తించటం చాలా కష్టం అన్లెస్ దెర్ ఈజ్ ఎన్ అవేకనింగ్ ఎమాంగ్ అవర్ జెల్స్ అలాగే ఇంకా వారు చాలా విషయాల పుస్తకంలో చర్చించారు చాలా ముఖ్యమైనటువంటి విషయం ఏమిటంటే మన దేశపు కుబేరులు ఏ విధంగా హార్వర్డ్ యూనివ యూనివర్సిటీకి రాజపోషకులుగా మారి భారత వ్యతిరేక పరిశోధనలను స్పాన్సర్ చేస్తున్నారు ఇది మనకు తెలియనటువంటి కొత్త విషయం ఇది సో మనకేదో మన మన బిజినెస్ హౌసెస్ పేరు మీద హార్వర్డ్ యూనివర్సిటీలో ఒక స్కూల్ డెవలప్ చేయటం ఒక డిపార్ట్మెంట్ డెవలప్ చేయటం ఒక చైర్ ఎస్టాబ్లిష్ చేయటం అవన్నీ చూసి మనం ఆనందపడుతూ ఉంటాం మన వాళ్ళకి చాలా మంచి పనులు చేస్తున్నారని కానీ మన ఇండస్ట్రీస్ట్లు అర్థం చేసుకోవటం లేదు పెద్ద పెద్ద పారిశ్రామిక ఫ్యామిలీస్ అర్థం చేసుకోవటం లేదు వాళ్ళ యొక్క వాళ్ళ దాన్ని ఏమి పరిశీలించట్లేదు తర్వాత వాళ్ళు ఇస్తున్నటువంటి ఫండ్స్ దేనికి ఉపయోగపడుతున్నాయి అనేది వాళ్ళు అర్థం చేసుకోవట్లేదు అది చాలా ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఇష్యూ వారు అందులోకి తీసుకొచ్చింది అంటే మన నిధులతో మన యువ మేధావులతో మన దేశానికి వ్యతిరేకంగా జరుగుతున్నటువంటి అనేక పరిశోధనలను నెట్వర్క్స్ను డేటా కలెక్షన్ గురించి వారు చెప్పారు ఇందాక అరవిందరావు గారు మాట్లాడుతూ బిగ్డ్ ఆర్టిఫిషియల్ ఇంటెలిజెన్స్ పుస్తకం గురించి చెప్పారు రాజీవ్ మల్హోత్ర గారు రాసిన ఆర్టిఫిషియల్ ఇంటెలిజెన్స్ స్నేక్స్ ఇందా గంగా పుస్తకంలో చాలా చోట్ల ఏ విధంగా డేటా బిగ్ డేటా ఏ విధంగా క్యాప్చర్ చేస్తున్నారనే విషయం వస్తుంది ఆ బిగ్ డేటా ఏ విధంగా క్యాప్చర్ చేస్తున్నారు బిగ్ డేటా యొక్క ఇంపార్టెన్స్ ఏమిటి ఆ బిగ్ డేటాని క్యాప్చర్ చేసి ఏ విధంగా ఆర్టిఫిషియల్ ఇంటెలిజెన్స్ ఆల్గారిథమ్స్కు దాన్ని ఉపయోగిస్తారు దానికి దాన్ని భారతదేశానికి వ్యతిరేకంగా ఏ విధంగా ఉపయోగించవచ్చు సో అట్లాగే ఇప్పుడు ఈ దావోస్ కుబేరులు ప్రపంచ కుబేరులు ఏ విధంగా వాళ్ళ యొక్క సామాజిక ఎజెండాను ప్రపంచం మీద రుద్దుపోతున్నారు రుద్దుతున్నారు సో ప్రతి ప్రతి ఏటా జరుగుతుంది దావేసులో మన రాష్ట్రాల నుంచి కూడా ముఖ్యమంత్రులు వెళ్తుంటారు ఫైనాన్స్ మినిస్టర్స్ వెళ్తుంటారు అందరూ వెళుతుంటారు సో వాళ్ళు ఏ విధంగా ఈ ప్రపంచంలోనే అత్యంత సంపన్నులైనటువంటి కుబేరులు ఏ విధంగా వాళ్ళు ఇప్పుడు దే ఆర్ ట్రయింగ్ టు మ్యానుపులేట్ ది సోషల్ ఎజెండాస్ అనే విషయాన్ని కూడా 
వారు తీసుకు వెలుగులోకి తీసుకొచ్చారు చాలా అనేకమైనటువంటి విషయాలని అందులో ఉన్నాయి పొందుపరిచారు సో హార్వర్డ్ విశ్వవిద్యాలయం కేంద్రంగా జరుగుతున్నటువంటి కుట్రను వారు బహిర్గతం చేశారు వీటన్నిటినీ కూడా మనం చదువుకోవాలి చాలా లోతుగా అధ్యయనం చేసి మనకి ఇచ్చినటువంటి విషయాలు సో ఏడు వందల పేజీలు మనకు ఇచ్చారు మూడు వందల యాభై పేజీలు ఎంతో రిఫరెన్సులు ఫుట్ నోట్స్ కూడా ఉన్నాయి అంటే వారు రాసిన ప్రతి సెంటెన్స్ కూడా ప్రతి వాక్యం కూడా ప్రతి కాన్సెప్ట్ కూడా దానికి సంబంధించినటువంటి పూర్తి ఎవిడెన్స్తో ఆ పుస్తకం రాయటం జరిగింది కాబట్టి మనం ఆ పుస్తకాన్ని బాగా చదువు చదవాలని కోరుకుంటూ అందులో విషయ అందులో ఉన్నటువంటి విషయాలని ప్రెస్ వాళ్ళు ముఖ్యంగా దాన్ని వెలుగు వెలుగులోకి తీసుకురావాలని కోరుకుంటూ నేను మీకు ఇస్తున్నాను థ్యాంక్ యూ వరండ్ ఆల్ ధన్యవాదాలు సారంగ్ పాండ్ గారు నా ది ఫ్లోర్ ఇస్ ఓపెన్ టు డాక్టర్ రాజీవ్ మల్హోత్రాజీ యూర్ ఆల్ వెరీ యాంక్షస్లీ వెయిటింగ్ ఫర్ యూ కైండ్లీ నమస్తే దిస్ ఈజ్ అన్ అమేజింగ్ వెల్కమ్ టు హైదరాబాద్ థ్యాంక్స్ టు అ లార్జ్ గ్రూప్ ఆఫ్ ఆర్గనైజర్స్ హూ పుట్ దిస్ వెరీ ఎలాబరేట్ త్రీ డే విజిట్ ఫర్ అస్ సో ఐఎమ్ వెరీ గ్రేట్ఫుల్ టు దాట్ అండ్ థ్యాంక్ యూ సో మచ్ దిస్ ఈజ్ ఐఎమ్ టోల్ దిస్ ఈజ్ ప్రైమరీలీ అ మీడియా ఇంటరాక్షన్ appetizer <clears throat> so i don't think it's a good idea i'll speak a whole lot because i think your questions would be very important and the speaker before me did a very good job summarizing in telugu he's also translating the book into telugu mm-hmm. he tells me it's almost ready so we are looking forward to having the writ- translated script and then we get it published so uh instead of repeating what all he said i think it's better we should move on to the interviews the i'm told there are certain people who want to come and interview and uh, the choice was doing it here versus somewhere else i thought why not do it here because we have everybody here so should, do we uh, uh, arvind ji do we sit here only How, uh, huh yeah that's a, so from there they'll ask questions first session from there next the second session will be individual key individual two three people okay so first it will be questions from there and then there'll be some individual people coming here to do interaction that's that's the format yes. fine so let's have questions so the first question yeah 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 good evening sir good evening madam this is niranjan desai from bharatavarsha news a local organization welcome to bhagyanagar sir this is not hyderabad this is bhagyanagar we proudly call it bhagyanagar always uh, my question related to infinity foundation let me read the question sir there's a lot of indifference and ignorance among the indian masses about the likes of the work of infinity infinity foundation i keep posting in uh, many groups but the traction that media uh, social media but the traction that i get for this minuscule very less compared to latest music trends in the market and uh, last but the least since yesterday midnight whole india is covering tribular's uh, uh, achievement in oscar and not to not to sangat oscar award no other news in any channel you open this is the picture so in this situation uh they don't want to know about our true history culture heritage history may be economic phase may be different phases that their indifference gone invite our born entire civilization my question is how to face it how to face it yeah how to bring them back to track so the question is that in spite of 30 years of work we've done not hobby not part time but full time and put all the everything i have tan man dhan into this uh, and with the help of very good people like you trying to promote it also uh, at the end of the day there is very little traction compared to some cricket match or some bollywood or some uh, uh, you know uh, some new uh, sensation uh, some popular culture excitement uh, so people like that now what is happened in my opinion compared to when i was a student 
long ago. Uh, I think the level of uh, uh, thinking has gone down in the sense that there is short attention span. Uh, we used to read a lot. Then television came, so it was less. Now social media even less. So now they tell you that you have, you have only a few seconds to make your point. Nobody is going to read hard. But we were reading very hard in those days. Our civilization is built on traditions which require a lot of concentration, a lot of attention span. Uh, there, would, there would be discussions and debates go on for days. Uh, the big uh, teachings are requiring serious thinking, concentration. So there is a degradation of the mind, quality of mind, the level of thinking has gone down. Now when you have people like that, then the, in a democracy, you have to cater to such people in order to get elected. So the politicians have to become low, small, low in thinking and become emotional. Offer them emotional idea here, there, something very simple everybody can understand. But if you offer them a serious proposition, something long term, an idea, concept, they're not going to understand. They're not going to vote for somebody like that. So they're going to vote for a person who talks about, you know, big, uh, uh, you know, bombastic statements. So you give them very uh, hyperbolic, very exaggerated statements, make them feel proud and make them feel good emotionally, then they will vote for you. So this is the problem of, it's a downward spiral of, uh, democracy requiring uh, uh, appeasement of people and this requires uh, giving them short term quick sensations and uh, the people are becoming like that and uh, then they are demanding more of the same. So a country like that will be ruined because uh, we are facing uh, China which is very different. China spent 50 years educating everybody for two generations. Everybody today Young people, they are educated, their parents were educated, their grandparents were educated. So third generation of educated people. And, and I, when I interact with them all over the world, they're very analytical, they have, can concentrate, they can think for themselves, even though they don't know English, but uh, uh, when you speak to them in English, they come back with intelligent answers. Whereas I find that a lot of our people, you ask them some question, they give you some random answer, yama ki baat, you know, useless talk. So they're not able to think clearly. So what to do is a very serious problem. The problem is not me and my, the traction. Who cares about my traction? I'm talking about bigger problems like lack of education system. Lack of proper values in our, in our uh, NCRT, the UPSC exam. I'm talking about, and you know what has happened is, as we point out in Snakes in the Ganga, the uh, government has outsourced a lot of the thinking to foreign consultants. So even though we say we are decolonized, we are running our country politically because we are getting elected. After getting elected, we are getting all kind of advisors coming in, teach, telling us about data security rights, national education policy, all, all sorts of things we are open to others coming, taking over. Now the government is going to allow, invite foreign universities to set up campuses with no restrictions. Indian universities have restrictions. But the restrictions do not apply to the foreign universities, neither in the subject they'll teach, nor the kind of people they can hire, nor how much they can pay, or what the tuition is. So they have an advantage over the local. It is actually not a level playing field. So this is a path to self-destruction. We can keep having slogans like Vishwa Guru and so on, but we are becoming Vishwa Chela. We are becoming Vishwa Chela, following other people, and very proud that we can say Vishwa Guru, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the glory of the rishis is great. But that's like saying, I, 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 Tandulkar made centuries, but I can be out for zero. Who cares? Because Tandulkar made centuries. That is stupid because we have to have produced thinking people today and people who are competent today. Like Arvind Jaoji said, you know, these are jobs that the national security people have to do. And they are not being vigilant about these things. So I am worried about this. And uh, I think... Thinkers like you and Arvind Raoji and Mr. Raghu and many other people here, they have to now take this as a campaign to put pressure on the political people, put pressure on the government people that they have to take these matters seriously. Otherwise, I think nothing can happen. But I would say another responsibility lies with parents to educate their children better. So, Vijay, would you want to comment? 
as far as educating our children, we've left it to the system. Not only have we left it to the system, we've all uh, lakhs of rupees to send their children overseas. So why not bring those colleges and those universities onto home turf so that you know they can just uh, get educated right here. But we haven't looked at what is the kind of education we're bringing in. So we don't do due diligence at all, at all levels. The government doesn't do due diligence to see who the experts are, who they, you know, whom are they working for, uh, you know, what is their allegiance towards. So when you bring an Ernst & Young or somebody like that, they are not worried about India or Indian civilization or, or the Indian workforce. They are just doing a consulting assignment to make money for their parent company. Right? So when, you, uh, when you're trying to bring in foreign universities, it's good to do due diligence to see uh, how have other countries handled foreign universities. For example, you don't have to take the extreme example of China, but you can look at somebody like Singapore. You can look at what Russia is doing. You can look at other countries that value their civilizational ethos, they, they value uh, their um, education system, things like that. For example, Singapore University had, I mean, Singapore had a, an MOU with Yale University. Yale NUS was a tie-up. They had an MOU for 10 years, started in 2014. And 2020, they said this was the last four-year batch. By 2024, we're going to sever the ties with Yale University. Yale is such a big brand and they were bringing liberal arts to Singapore. But Singaporean parliament discussed it. They said, this is making our society very divisive and therefore we don't want Western liberal arts in Singapore. It's a wise decision. And they cut the ties with Yale University because it was not good for Singapore. They said Singaporeans are, are multiracial, very diverse, different ethnicities, and we've been living harmo harmoniously for many, many decades. And we do not want um, Western ideas of social science to come and break our society apart. And we are a very small country. We can't afford to do this. So these are, these are big decisions uh, that some governments take. Apparently ours doesn't. Similarly, even in the house, we don't do due diligence as to what the education our children receive. Right? Whether in school, in you know, NCRT, where are they going? If we send them abroad, what are they studying? How much are we paying? What are we getting in return? If you look at liberal arts, students from liberal arts universities overseas, when I say liberal arts, liberal arts also uh, has STEM subjects, you know, pure sciences and mathematics also under liberal arts, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking mainly about social sciences and humanities. And most of these uh, uh, students that graduate, Overseas, even from great universities like Harvard, do not get a job. If you, if you graduate after four years, you know, with a quarter million dollars in loan, student loans you have, to get a degree in gender studies or African American studies or some of these studies which come under liberal arts, you have no skill. This is unskilling India. Bringing Western liberal arts universities is actually paying money to unskill India and make activists out of our students. So this is happening overseas. They, they all live in their mother's basement, their parents' basements, and that's a big no-no for, you know, for, uh, for the Western society. And they can't get a job, and they have student loans. So the US president has said, I will forgive all student loans just to get votes. But this is such a worthless education. So we haven't even done due diligence for that. So I think we don't do due, due diligence, and that goes back to the low IQ um, you know, uh, and attention deficit sort of uh, society that we have, and especially the younger generation. Thank you, sir. And Madam, for the detailed elaborate. Thank you. Definitely work for the whatever was started here. I have a more provocative answer. But maybe I'll make even more enemies. But you know, think about it, consider it. Is our Indians ready for democracy? I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question. Ancient India was not a democracy. We had good noble kings who did very well for our country. Western 
idea of democracy is itself in test because they're also having serious social problems. You see, including United States, about its democracy, about uh, its institutions. Now, democracy was proposed in ancient times in places like Greece and so on. Those are very small. And the idea was that everybody is highly educated. If you have a very educated population, they can make these decisions for what is the best for the country. But if they are not that well informed, then they will be more emotional. So my question is this. You don't run a cricket team based on democracy of the players. They, they will be the captain who makes decisions. You don't run an army based on the democracy of all the soldiers. It's the generals who decide. You don't run a corporate entity based on all the factory workers electing and voting, deciding what the policy will be, what the product will be, how the pricing will be. You have executives who make decisions. So if most of these, most areas that are competitive, that are, have to compete with other people, require subject matter experts to decide not democracy. A surgeon does not, the sur how a surgery will be done is decided by the most qualified people who are surgeons. You don't go to all the staff and the nurses and all these people in the hospital to vote for how to do this particular surgery because they don't know. So, you know, any expertise, whether it is medicine, whether it is cricket, whether it is, uh, you know, whatever, it is not decided by democracy. The court does not decide based on a democracy, what is everybody sitting in the court, what do you think, is he right, is he guilty, not guilty, it's not decided. It is decided by people who are experts. So why couldn't governance be also by people who are real subject matter experts rather than people who are popular? This is a question, it's a very provocative question. I'm not saying yes or no, but I'm asking this question that intellectuals like you should raise, that, ha that you know, we, are, we, we can be very proud we've done better than we were, and that is true. We are better than we were, and the government is better than the previous government. That is true. But even this government has to do a lot just to emotionally manage people, which a China does not need to do. They don't have to worry about it. They can go faster. So I'm just leaving this as a food for thought for future debate. Uh, my to you would be uh, very simple. My name is Suresh Kocharal. I'm from Nationalist Hub. I'm also a, a social media influencer, that way, if you can call it. Uh, my question is simple. I come from a state called Kerala. Of course, I grew up in Hyderabad. I speak Telugu fluently. My question to you is the brainwashing which happens in universities. Now, we speak of JNU and you're going to one such university tomorrow or day after, I don't know, at CU. Um, these brainwashings, we believe, starts in the colleges. But can you, I can tell you that way back when Nehru was the prime minister, that time, any student, and sir, the two civil service officers sitting here, uh, any student, civil service officer who qualified from Kerala had to undergo an intelligence background check. This is the time EMS Nambudri part was. So my question is, the brainwashing is starting at the school level in states like Kerala, with, with the student unions and all that. So by the time a student comes to the college, they are primed to be a rebel against the system. How do we tackle this? Because I don't think it's happening in many states, but it's happening in a few states. Thank you. I think the problem is universal in the sense that school education is not very good for the, is not very patriotic and good history, good values are not being taught. And so it is the old uh, education system curriculum is not very good for children all over the country. And the parents are not very well educated about what to teach in these terms where parents have their own jobs and they themselves have been raised in this Nehruvian idea of secularism and so on without proper understanding of our own history. So neither the parents nor the school system teach this. And the gurus could be the only other vehicle. The gurus are just teaching their meditation and their puja, bhakti and all. They're not teaching uh, things about nation. They're not teaching the Arth Shastra, for example. They're not teaching what are the lessons from Mahabharat that you can put in your life today. They're not teaching Dharma Shastra. They're teaching Upanishad, which is very good, Gita, which is very good, and various pujas and all that, which is all very nice. I like that. But none of the influences on the child is building this kind of character that we want, like some of the very strong countries like China are building their character. So it is being filled in by media and social media. This is raising the social media, Instagram and all these things, raising the children for, you know. So by the time they come to college, they don't even have their parents' supervision to keep an eye on them. At least at home they have that. 
So now they are out of the supervision of parents and they are mingling with other students and uh, they are trying to impress each other, peer pressure to conform. And the old guard of professors, professors in these universities are all very left-wing types and they move the students in that direction. So this is what the dynamics is, a very difficult thing. Now, in, after eight years of new government, they've not been able to transform either the NCRT curriculum or the UPSC curriculum or the, uh, the, the professors in, on a large enough scale because uh, uh, BJP and RSS do not have a deep bench of uh, highly qualified trained intellectuals that can fill in these jobs because it was not, the focus was not on creating intellectual, uh, Kshatriya's focus of the Shakha is not creating intellectuals. So that is a vacuum we don't have in our country. The left has created these ecosystem and we have not created a, a sufficiently good, powerful ecosystem. So that is a dangerous situation we are facing right now. Now, things are improving but very slowly. We don't have that much time. I don't believe that China giving us too much time. Things will happen fast. Things in the, on the global stage are happening very quickly. And technology-wise, we're lagging behind. We, have, we are not putting, if you look at percent of GDP, invested in R&D. India is one of the lowest in the world, even today. So how do we catch up with technology, R&D and technology if we are not investing enough? There is money with the billionaires, but they are living good life, making profit and living good life, not putting it back into long-term R&D. What's the reason? Why are these guys who are making so much money not able to invent chat GPT or, or search engines or uh, platforms or AI engines or all the technology is coming, we are buying, importing from somewhere. There is no excuse. China, a much poorer country than India, 50, 60 years ago, has educated its people, does not depend on Apple or Amazon or Google or Facebook. They have their own. And they are not only doing this very good job for domestic control of the social media, exporting it to Africa, Latin America, very countries are using Chinese platform. So what, how can we say, when I was, uh, 20 years ago, I was told that one advantage China can never have is software, because we are more creative and they are, they are communist and they are not creative, but look, they have gone ahead of us in artificial intelligence. I was told that we have the English language advantage, they don't have, so we will do better. All these slogans and all the newspapers and all the politicians all over the world very proud that we are the software guru and whatnot. Point is, the, the reality is this. You are a software company, uh, city also here, big software hub. We are supplying labor to the American multinationals to do the software which they will own. They are the owners of the intellectual property. They are the owners of the patent. We are supplying the labor. So just because we are supplying labor doesn't mean we, are, we, we own the technology. The difference between whose technology it is, which is American, and who is supplying the labor. So we, are, we have trained labor to get jobs and middle, uh, they bring uh, repatriation of income and good for uh, cities like this where you can apply, bring a lot of create jobs. It is good. But China not only supplied labor for factories, but they ended up outsmarting their client, outsmarting the Americans, building the products themselves. Better, cheaper to compete against them. And learned the technology from the Americans and then went ahead. Why couldn't we do that? After all, Microsoft is here with tens of thousands of people, and I'm told Google is here and Apple is here, all these people are here. They've been here for a long time. Lacks of our people are working. Why are we still dependent on their products and not able to build the same product ourselves in our own name? So this is, are we just followers? Are we tech coolies? I mean, are we, are we, are we Vishwa coolies and Vishwa chelas? Followers and doing dirty work and low-level work for the owners. Or are we, how do can we call ourselves Vishwa Guru? We're certainly not Vishwa Guru technologically. We're certainly not Vishwa Guru in terms of uh, media and discourse and academic who, who teaches, who controls the discourse on India is not people in India. These discourses are set from places like Harvard, the international discourse. So I think there are serious issues and it's difficult to get uh, our people to take this up seriously. That's the point. Uh, if you say too much, then they don't like you and they block you. This is a problem.
also on on the china issue a couple of years ago um, actually a decade or so ago two decades ago china encouraged uh, english language education they brought in many teachers from america to teach english two years ago or three years ago they said enough we're not going to teach our our school children english anymore we don't need that at all in fact the government controls um, science math and history education in china there was an edtech company that was doing some stem type course and uh, they were doing it well overnight it was a publicly traded company uh, they made it a government uh, an ngo overnight i'm not saying we do such things but we can learn from the trends so china basically says that uh, the world will be speaking mandarin and we don't need to uh, teach our people english anymore whereas we have not even been able to make textbooks in the vernacular languages successfully even though we know research has shown that children actually learn better in their mother tongues we don't have science and math in uh, different um, you know vernacular languages even till today though the education policy sort of broadly talks about oh we should have uh, all these courses every every subject should be taught in the vernacular we don't have we don't have teachers that are trained we don't have curriculum we don't have textbooks we, we have nothing whereas china is on the other way they are so aggressive that they've stopped english altogether uh good afternoon sir my my name is kandula ramana reddy uh, i am from karnool district uh am itne der se education ke bare mein baat kar raha hai in telugu there is a word khuti kosam koti vidyalu chadu is only reading and writing vidya is different okay so many people are uh, doing their degrees and master degrees only put their uh, in wedding cards beside their names okay and uh, vidya is a different like iti vocational courses some other these things you said china is not going to give more time okay in india for manufacturing sector there is no skill labor today who is going to correct this people unnecessarily people are studying degrees btech in software if you do civil engineering doing software mechanical engineering doing software everybody is going to software side they are studying four years in engineering in engineering college and then six months they are doing some course in amirpet and then everybody is going to uh, software companies so our skill manpower is not working for our country our production for our nation who is going to correct this so you know the problem is we do not have a plan planning mentality the education people are educating separately the industry is separate in what need they have so in education is not uh, a, a training for industry and the industry and the education is also when people go abroad they study whatever the hell they want they're not bringing back the technology we need the china sends people they know we need so many people of this that that technology and they go bring it back they steal it whatever they do they bring it back because china needs it so you know there is a very central this is a benefit of a planning now you can blame the center but why not andhra do its own planning you could have a state level very detailed plan saying this is our industrial policy this is how many engineers how many technicians how many people who are crane operators how many whatever all kind of jobs they are not all uh, theoretical jobs like computer science they are not all software jobs there are many kinds of jobs and you, so you can create a, a, an industrial plan a development plan and an education plan all combined and a security plan and be a be a model state i think that the states should take some leadership and develop their own strategy and show that you know no, i don't know, see no of a single state that is done this take artificial intelligence the impact of ai will be very serious and it's all being done from the uh, uh, niti ayog and they are niti ayog are getting it done by american consultants now every state should have a different impact the the impact of ai on a agriculture state on a state with making pharma state making uh, automobile industry state with banking different different impact different impact on who will lose jobs and what kind of new jobs are created and what kind of training is needed so 
you take your own state. Why does Andhra not have an AI policy, its own AI policy needed by every state? You need a state level technological commission. A, 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 you know, a, a commission. So the states have to take this responsibility, in my opinion. Sir, thank you for the uh, input, sir. Uh, I have a question to Mrs. Vijaya Vishwanathan. Uh, you've been talking about, ma'am, um, the due diligence at a micro level by the parents, at a macro level by the administrators. Now, from the Indian context, uh, the hurdles are the diversity which we have and the span of control to the administrators. Now, he, uh, Rajiv Ji was just referring to the example of Andhra Pradesh, for example. Uh, unless and until the government, now that the administration, they are trying to number of votes across the country and all, the span of control is a problem. These are the limitations which the existing government has. What is your suggestion? Is Vedic introduction of Vedic mathematics in the NEP as one subject or introduction of Gurukulam, which was existing before the British had come into? Do you think is that a solution for us to come back to our original winning ways? Okay, so control, let's answer this in two parts. The first part is uh, nothing against IS officers uh, or karikartas, but if you look at something like the education policy, it is made by people, uh, bureaucrats, right? I think it should be made by stakeholders. So a few years ago, I was in OMR uh, in Chennai. In, I went to meet a friend of mine who is a chartered accountant who runs this huge outsourcing center. And so I went to the sixth or seventh floor and, and there's an ocean. There were like a thousand you know, youngsters sitting in tight cubicles with cameras. And I, you know, I thought I was in a prison and it was so claustrophobic and I said, how? So I asked him, I said, Vidyadhar, how do, you, how do these people stay, I mean, day after day? So he says, these are the kids that get educated in the, um, you know, the uh, state board. So they have no skills. So after 10th or 12th, they, they sign a contract for two years and they are basically bust from the slums or whatever and brought in here to do transcription work. So the first year is training. And I said, how many, after two years, how many people stay? What's your attrition? He said, 100%. The day their contract finishes, all of them vanish. So he says, the first year we teach, the second year we, we get, you know, uh, some kind of work out of them. And that's how this game works. So he's a stakeholder. He should be part of the education policy. Or a parent who struggles to put their kids through, knows the ups and downs, ins and outs. Look at all the mothers that struggle with their children, you know, putting them through. Or somebody in, who are teaching uh, students who read history books and say, this doesn't make sense, but yet I'm forced to, you know, uh, teach the kids. So these are people who are stakeholders and they should be an active part of the policy, not just bureaucrats. I have nothing against bureaucrats, they're really smart people, but they can't be subject matter experts from election commission to, to education. Right? So th this is something we can do. We are, not, we are not doing. As far as Indic knowledge systems are concerned, I think absolutely yes. Um, I've done it personally myself. I've educated two boys um, in the Western system and with Ganita Shastram, Samskritam, things like that. Not out of nostalgia, but because of relevance. It makes them think differently. It gives a different drishti. For example, Ganita Shastram has ideas of encryption. Like you use Bhuta Sankhya where, you know, it's all in beautiful poetry. And um, when they say Surya or Chandra, it's one because there's only one. So one has to sort of decrypt and say, oh, if when you see Surya, it's one. So there are ways of, and then Katapayadi system. There are different ways of encryption in Ganitam. So these are concepts that young children are exposed to. And they're, so they're very relevant. It's not because, but of course, many of us ourselves have not been exposed to this kind of education. So it takes, you know, to, it's very difficult to find experts. So you have to first create curriculum. You have to convince parents and others that this is actually good and it benefits students. And, and then you have to also train teachers because we, you have uh, teachers that know Sanskritam but not Ganitam, but who know mathematics but not Sanskritam. So this is a, a huge task which only the government can take on. But nobody in the government knows anything about all of this. Neither will they let stakeholders and others take charge.
So it's not like we can't do it, we don't have the resources, but we just don't do it in the right way. Uh, Ma'am, this is Pani Haran. Uh, this question is to uh, Vijaya Vishwanath. Uh, this is Pani Haran, I'm, I'm from Hans India. Uh, when we are talking about education, I wanted to refer a few uh, case studies. There is a general practice of women uh, wearing flowers in their hair. It's a long, it's a very uh, uh, centuries old practice. Uh, no, by doing this, uh, in fact, you know, seasonally they used to change those flowers. If we really look into the impact of it, they were really supporting hundreds of uh, uh, farmers, horticulture, uh, sorry, floriculture farmers. There are some women who used to come and sell. There are a lot of uh, areas that. Is. So this way, if you look at, uh, say, before uh, invasions, like Muslim invasion, the purchasing capacity of women, or, or this Indian women, particularly in South India, I'm telling you, this is more than vis -vis their counterparts in the Europe and this. But still, increasingly, if we look at into the women's studies area, these people are labeled as kitchen birds. So here there are case studies that are there, but why is it that you know, uh, our women's study people are not looking at these things? I think Rajiv can answer that. Um, I, I basically think we, we as a generation do not understand many issues civilizationally. We, because I, I look at the society at large, people do not understand the, you know, the ideas, the metaphysics of, uh, of the Indic civilization, where everything is connected, everybody is involved, everybody has a role, everybody has an obligation to the collective. Um, in fact, in the Varna Jati uh, caste book, which we released um, just a couple of weeks ago, we talk about how, you know, you get an idea. In the West, you have identities, these, um, these sort of synthetic identities that are given based on um, some margin, somebody deems you marginalized, um, you know, or based on gender or sexuality or, or some other criteria, which are all sort of artificial. Whereas in the Vedic system, you got an identity when you had an obligation. So as a brahmacharya, you had a dharma. You know, this is your obligation, you know, you're supposed to study. As a grahastha, you, ha you, you got the identity of a grahastha only because you had an obligation, a contribution, you know, to the larger, you know, yajna, as Rajivji talks, uh, talks about in some of his books. So you get an identity, not for sort of rights, but you get an identity. If you're a woman, you have a stri dharma. You have a purusha, you have a purusha dharma. So even if gender, there is a dharma, a kula dharma you have. So any identity that you have, varna, ashrama, whatever it is, the identity is given to you just for a brief period. It it's doesn't last forever. And it is there because you have a, 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 a yagya, you have an offering to the collective, right? So these are ideas that we don't understand. We just say, oh, you know, we take Western ideas and then superimpose it on our society and then uh, struggle to find ways. And we also agree with them saying, oh, yeah, yeah, these are marginalized, this is caste. We, we don't understand the difference between, you know, what is Varna, what is Varna Dharma, what... So these are fundamental issues with us. Going back to our very first question, we do not know who we are. We do not know where we've come from. Uh, we don't have the attention span to learn, even if we don't know. So when you're like that, then all these sort of problems are sort of the result of, of you know, uh, having, uh, you know, being ignorant about your civilizational uh, roots. So uh, I have a question to uh, uh, Raju, sir. Uh, so, uh, there is a kind of dichotomy with which we see uh, these days, particularly in case of Hindus. They celebrate a lot of uh, festivals which are, in a way, aligned to natural geometry, derived from the life-centric cosmology of Hindus, or Sanatana, whatever. So, on the one hand, these people celebrate all these festivals and use all the symbols, the, the rituals and everything goes on. On the other hand, the parents, uh, they insist their children to be experts in physics, maths, and English, and this, these areas. 
If you really look at the background of it, you know the word phusis is there in ancient Greece. And here, prakriti. Both are, uh, the concepts are both are similar. Then phusis has turned into physics natura, then to physics. Means life-centric cosmology too. It was reduced to the level of materialistic cosmology. From there, uh, the controlling of nature, all materialistic principles, science, okay, all these started there on that side of the continent. continent. So, so here the children uh, are you know, not able to grasp the overall cosmology of science. So on the one hand, they are pulled towards a materialistic dire diversion, direction. On the other hand, uh, they have to keep up their own tradition. It's almost like you know, Cartesian uh, dichotomy that they are subjected to. How to resolve this? So you're raising an interesting question, you know, that the practice of dharma has reduced to symbolism. That's what you're saying. And people do not understand the metaphysics, the, the philosophical, the, the cosmological dimension, uh, which, is more, which is important even to understand the rituals and symbolism, you need to understand the metaphysics people don't know. And if they understood the metaphysics, then the, what they are doing in physics, chemistry, math would make more sense. They would know the context. Because they would know the context in which this understanding of matter and material causation, that you, physics is material causation. Okay, that's what physics is. So material causation is very nice and very important. It's very practical. You can make engineering marvels out of it because you need to know how it works. But it, it, it is limited in what it can do. You can do a lot more if you understood cosmology. And then there are so many other higher levels of knowledge that can be very practical also. So uh, the, the issue is we don't have teachers who teach all that. So the gurus are not teaching that and that is their job. We are giving them unlimited money. They have no shortage of money, no shortage of reputation, prestige, clout, power, none of that. No shortage of number of followers. There is no excuse for the gurus not to take on these topics and say, I'm, my job is to educate the whole masses on these matters. Because they have the adhikar, people will go to them and listen to what they are saying. It, even more than the government, I think the gurus have responsibility in that. That's how I feel about it. And uh, uh, so, you know, there's no shortage of where the problem can start being solved. But we need that initial ignition, that fire. Either government has to solve it or gurus have to solve it. Somehow it has to be solved. My worry is we're running out of time. My worry is that the, the solutions, the, the uh, capturing of the mind is going to go more and more very rapidly into algorithms controlled by foreign people. These algorithms are the new devatas. These algorithms are the new adhikaris, the new gurus. People are bowing to them in social media and education is coming through algorithms. Uh, judiciary, some legal system, how you hire a person, all the personnel departments are using algorithms and AI to figure out who's qualified. So we are being run by artificial intelligence, which is run by big data. And the training of these AI systems is largely being done by people who, the people who own all these algorithms, not Indians. So we are being colonized by algorithm, algorithmic colonization. This, because we are not smart enough, we are not controlling ourselves, we are not thinking strategically, others are filling that gap, gap, that vacuum of power. Which is why I wrote this book, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Power, Five Battlegrounds. That is what this, is not a book or technical book, it's a book on philosophy, policy, social implications, exactly like what you're saying. You've identified a problem that there is a gap. And in my work, I've identified that because of this gap, and we are not doing anything about it, this gap is being filled by new technology. It's like the new teacher, the new guru for us. So, uh, two small questions. After this, we're going to end this session. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one interview for you, sir. So, two last questions to take. I request you to keep the question straight. And Hello, sir. This is Aarti Kashyap from Deccan Chronicle. Um, the question is, as a younger generation, I want to understand, have we become less tolerant as a society now? Or it has always been the case, more or less, 
And now we see more of it because of the social media, um, the things are coming up out uh, so easily and so quickly. So has it been the same uh, or it has been changing? And if so, uh, what are a uh, few reasons that you can cite for that? Thank you. So w by less tolerant, you mean social conflicts? Yes. So social conflicts have already always existed, but now because people are not isolated geographically, they are all, everybody's business is everybody else's business. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing and everybody's saying. So the, uh, the opportunity for conflict is more. Also there is overpopulation, more, more and more people competing for fewer resources. So there is competition among communities all over the world. Now the thing that is troubling is that the use of social media to create conflicts is being controlled by other people. It's not our people who control this social media. We do not have our own social media. So what, what the algorithm will support or not support and who it will deplatform is not up to you or me or anybody in this room. Even our government, they do not have control over the social media. They've sold it out. This is a very serious matter. This, the, the, it is the social media which created the, uh, the Arab Spring uprising, the Hong Kong revolts, all the problems in very many countries including the CAA and all these farmers things and all we had here, there were a lot of hands of the f social media. And the social media is not Indian. This is very, it's a, it's a kind of a remote control management of the emotions and psychology of our people. And so you will see that these things will happen more and more. Just wait till the next election, there'll be a lot more of this. One last question, sir. Uh, namaste, I'm Shailaja. I'm representing Samachar Bharti here. So one simple question. What do uh, American ambassador designate to India, who has already declared his intent that, you know, he's going to work on the core issues of CAA and so on. So, I mean, how do we face these external onslaughts? It is very much so, part of the system. So. Yeah, so we've predicted this in our uh, Breaking India 2.0. Read the book. We were telling you where it's coming from. Uh, when the moment this guy was considered you know, this LA mayor and all that, I wrote about it, that this guy is bad news and India should have, Indian media should have taken some other stuff and started writing articles. Government can't stop. But if the media and the public outcry, then the foreign country thinks again. So you see the first test by, re by leaking a rumor that there is a rumor that Mr. X will be appointed ambassador because they want to see what is the reaction that comes back. If the reaction coming back is very, very tough and strong, and I wrote that. I wrote that, but Indian media didn't want to even write, uh, publish my article. Indian media did not even want to publish my article. So, you know, this thing, nobody complained, so it's all become fine. And now it is too late. Now, this guy is, who, who is the ambassador of US going to come here, believes that he is going to negotiate on behalf of United States, not with the Indian government, but with individual communities. So he will negotiate with Khalistanis here, Sikhs, and say, okay, what do you want? Are you right? Are you wrong? It's like the British used to adjudicate disputes among Indians. British used to adjudicate. Now American guy, ambassador here will have better can invite Nagas, invite Manipur people, invite people from here, uh, Dravidian people, invite some group here and there, Maoist, and he will hold a batak in the embassy and say, okay, I'm going to have a seminar uh, for uh, human rights, I'm going to have a seminar for social justice, and I'm going to have a seminar with the Indian LGBTQ people. Now he's going to conduct, it's like on one hand we have Chandra Chuth, who's, who's doing the job of government, thinking it's as if he's running the government, on the other hand, we'll have the American ambassador doing this. What are we going to do? So, you know, why is the Indian government not able to think ahead? I had a, I have had many meetings with people in Delhi, and they said, we have everything going on, we are reacting, we are responding. So I told them, if you make, if you make a list of the most important five or ten negative things that have happened, one is this ambassador, one is what happened in Geneva, you know, those things. One is the BBC uh, thing, one is all these articles in American press. One is, you know, uh, allegations from the U.S. government that your, your uh, democracy is being compromised. If you look at all these foreign interventions, how many of them were you able to predict before it happened? And this person who's a very top, the top guy, I don't want to name, he was silent. I said, you are telling me it's all under control, but you only react after it happens. You have no ability to predict. 
So in fact, we are predicting sometimes years in advance and you're not taking it seriously. So this is a serious problem I have with the current dispensation, with all due respects to them. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, that's the last question we're going to take. And uh, we request Hands India people who wanted a one-on-one -on -one session. Hands India, please come forward. You can have it. On. Otherwise, the question and answer session is over. Uh, once the Hands India one-on-one -on -one session is over, probably we'll uh, have Nationalistic Hub for a one-on-one -on -one session with Mr. Suresh Kochatil. That's the program going forward. I sincerely. Mike to Mike on the other parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to have
is a book that has many narratives affecting many demographic groups. So there are students that are affected, 
<coughs> scholars that are affected, universities that are affected, government that is affected, business leaders that are affected. So it has so many people that are affected with some, you know, uh, some narratives coming out of uh, Harvard University that we are addressing it individually, catering our talk to the demographic in question. So your foundation uh, in the program of Chatsworth, if I'm wrong, please. So just let us know how you are working on the program. What do you mean? Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. So the question is about our Infinity Foundation working on Indian traditions. Uh, it was started about 30 years ago by me after I left my business to focus on 100% full time with our, my own funds and my own time and I've done this full time for 30 years. So I understand what the Westerners are writing, what the media is writing in the West, what the church is saying, what the government is saying, but so this is what I do for a long time. And my, my experience said that all of the world, world why, why on, a, on, a, on a popular level there is appreciation of yoga people, there's a lot of vegetarianism, there's a lot of meditation, a lot of interesting things about Indian food and so on. But a large part of the Indian knowledge is being appropriated almost like stolen. And they're calling it Christian yoga, they're calling it Western science, neuroscience, you know, meditation could be turned into neuroscience. Ayurveda has been turned into patented medicines that the foreigners are owning, the Western companies are owning. So why our culture is doing well, but it, we are losing control of it. And we are losing control because we don't have a you know, overall strategy in our own country to respect this knowledge. Others will not respect if you don't respect yourself. This is the thing. China respects itself very strong. Chinese medicine, you know, Chinese thought. Because China is controlling their own narrative, they export their idea to the world. And the world has to listen. India, there is no government or no agency that has the power, clout, and the strategy to create our narrative and export it to the world. So we say we are Vishwa Guru, but we are Vishwa Chela. Even Indian studies is being done by other people more than by ourselves. This is a sad state of affairs. And in India, until we revive our own respect for our traditions and uh, organize it in a systematic way, export it from here, then until we do that, others are not going to respect it. This is our problem. based on our meditation. <coughs> this is, uh, Harvard is doing it, a lot of places are doing it. Why aren't we doing it? One thing I will tell you, the budget of India for research and development is among the lowest in the world. The percentage of GDP spent on research is very low. So we are not focusing on research and creating intellectual property and patents. Corporate sector want to license somebody else's know rather than creating Indian sector. This is a job, so as far as medical knowledge patenting is concerned, Indian pharma industry should do it. Because this is there in the field of pharma, they're making a lot of money, very rich. They should be taking this job. So we are doing little bit here and there. Even our traditional healing systems are being studied by Westerners more, and they are taking the patents. Because they do the hard work of validation. They do the hard work of testing it out in different ways, filling out, writing papers, and then filing for patents. So this is like, we are too complacent and lazy that our Rishi has done a lot of We don't have to do anything. Because our Rishi was so great, we don't have to do anything. It's not like that. We have to continue. Every generation has to produce its own Rishis, its own intellectuals, and we have to work hard. This is a price we're paying for not for being lazy. I think. In fact, 
uh, many of you probably do not know that the whole idea of reincarnation is being studied in the West under this under um, it's called perceptual sciences or something like that. In the medical school in Virginia, you can go check it out. University of Virginia, in the medical school, the neuroscience department, they're studying reincarnation, which is which we've known forever, but we've not done anything with it. So tomorrow there's something that they'll come out and we will have to import it back into India. One last question, sir. We have written so many books, sir. You have been lost in making India and Sexual So you always uh, show in your book that Satya Dharma, Shishya Parampara. So these are the values. I believe that the government has uh, focused on the books. Maybe they have made an along in taking and planning that the next education should be this kind of chapter that our new generation will learn and they will make an wish for growth. But I believe, so what is your opinion that will the government is really focusing on your work of this? So, you know, a lot of individuals are reading the books and benefiting from it and starting their own channels, but sometimes in their own name, not even quoting our work. Even in the government, they are getting influence, even in the ministry, they are getting influence. But the, unless, you see, we have a tradition that the parampara has to be respected. If you don't respect the parampara, then you know what happens is that the continuity of knowledge is lost. So it, we are working very hard producing knowledge and somebody reads it here, somebody reads it there, but in an organized systematic way, government should take it seriously. The government should develop a master's degree course on these books and introduce it into policy making, introduce it into training IS officers, ICS officers, IPS officers. That work is not happening. That work because government is very busy winning elections, economic development, there are so many challenges. So this business of really rewriting, redoing the whole education system based on this new knowledge that we are trying to bring out, this is a very important work that has not yet happened.